So hello, thank you so much, Ella, for the kind introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to present at this Corcoran session. Um, we are presenting to you today, as Ella has already said, from Sydney, Australia. And usually it's just so sunny and beautiful here shown in the picture, which may be a slight consolation given that we seem to be one of the only places in the world that is still in a hard lockdown at the moment. We're both located at the NHMRC Clinical Trial Centre, which is part of the University of Sydney. And um, there we lead the so-called Next Generation Evidence Synthesis Group, uh, which is all about exciting systematic review approaches, such as prospective meta-analysis, that we will be presenting on today. And um, before we start, just briefly, um, we have a few conflicts of interest to declare. The most important one being, as Ella has already said, that we are both convening the Cochrane PMA Methods Group. So we are both very biased toward how great this methodology is. Um, and similarly, a lot of the examples that we are using today are from our own studies. So again, um, there may be some conflict of interest here in trying to sell them to you. So today, what we are hoping to cover are um, limitations in systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And um, then we will talk about how prospective meta-analysis can help and address those. Um, this is, by the way, my little puppy, Charlie. I had to put her on here. Um, and she may come up every now and again if things get too technical. Um, and the other thing is we will be using Slido again with a little quiz. So we're hoping that you'll pay attention and that we explain well enough so you can answer that quiz in the end. But before I dive into the technicalities of prospective analysis, let me start with a practical and important example of why we need to collaborate more in health research. At the start of the global pandemic of COVID-19, we have seen an unprecedented rise in clinical trials on One Health research area, COVID-19, with over 100 new trials registered on clinical trials platform each week worldwide. In this figure, you can see um, new trials registered each week at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. And you can see the numbers were in the 100s. Now, um, this was a great development, right? So we saw medical research in action to address an urgent health problem. Yet there was one large limitation with these trials. Um, as you can see on the left-hand side in the figure, um, the trials were largely underpowered to detect differences in important clinical outcomes. So this figure shows you the median target sample size for COVID-19 treatment trials up to May 2020. Um, and they were targeting up participant numbers in the 100s, whereas on the right-hand side, you can see a simple power calculation of um, the number of participants we need to, to cover to detect differences in possibly the most important outcome of mortality. And they would have been in the thousands of a subgroup analysis, even in the 10 thousands. So that means despite the large number of trials and the large number of participants that have agreed to be randomized to different treatments, um, we are unlikely to derive answers to the question, does this treatment reduce risk of dying from COVID-19 from these clinical trials? Now, I've seen um, many of you uh, have experience in systematic reviews meta-analyses. So the solution may seem obvious to you. Um, why don't we just combine those trials? And in fact, many of those trials were addressing the same research questions or addressing the same treatments. As you can see in this graph, um, which shows number of tr um, trials per treatment. And for example, for hydroxychloroquine alone, there were 230 trials in this early period. Um, so the solution to the many underpowered trials would be to synthesize them in the meta-analysis. And um, again, whilst the figure on the left shows is the one you've already seen with the median target sample sizes, the one on the right shows the sample size of all trials in the same three ends combined. And now we can see that in combination, the trials would have excellent power to detect differences in outcomes such as mortality. One may even argue that um, too many participants were randomized to some comparisons. Do we really need over 200,000 participants to hydroxychloroquine to realize that this treatment is harmful? But in general, the message is clear. We need to combine evidence to obtain sufficient power to determine um, effectiveness of treatments. And I would like to go a step further and say that we need to plan trials strategically and plan to combine them prospectively in a prospective meta-analysis. Now, you may ask yourself, why can't we just wait for each trial to be completed um, to, to then combine them in systematic review meta-analysis? 
And this is something I'm hoping to address in this presentation today by talking about the present problems of traditional systematic reviews and how that can be overcome using prospective meta analysis methodology. And right in the end, we will come back to our example of COVID-19. Over to you, Kali. Thanks, Lena. So um, I'm going to assume from the word cloud that you all have a pretty good understanding of systematic reviews and why they are positioned at the top of the evidence hierarchy and are widely used to inform healthcare policy and practice. However, there are several limitations and potential sources of bias, as Lena mentioned, and these are associated with uh, traditional systematic reviews. And by traditional, I mean retrospective aggregate data systematic reviews. So I'll briefly talk through some of these now, and then we'll, we'll um, explain how these can be addressed using prospective meta-analysis methodology. So firstly, next slide. Firstly, systematic reviews and meta-analyses um, can be affected by publication bias and selective outcome reporting. And these describe the phenomena that positive results are more likely to be published and thus included in meta-analyses. And conversely, as shown in this illustration, non-significant results are more likely to be hidden, and hence the term the file draw problem is often also used. These concepts are also nicely illustrated by this figure, so where each circle represents a trial. So red means the trial was negative or did not support the intervention, and green means it was positive, so it favoured the intervention. So the first set of circles on the left represent the full study cohort addressing a specific research question. We can see there's a fairly even distribution of positive and negative trials. However, we know that only around 50% of biomedical studies publish their results, and these are likely to be more positive, and this is represented by the second set of circles. We also know that only around 50% of outcomes are completely reported per trial and those that are reported tend to be more positive and have larger effect sizes. And this um, leads to some negative trials actually becoming positive, um, hence the increase in green circles um, in the third uh, image there. So this leaves us with a biased subset of the evidence, which can skew overall results to actually appear a lot more positive than they are. And this can then lead to inappropriate recommendation of interventions, and it represents massive research waste. So another limitation um, of traditional systematic reviews relates to retrospective inclusion of studies. So most systematic reviewers have an idea of studies that are happening in their area and what their results are. And this knowledge can affect their hypotheses and selection criteria. And this can ultimately again skew the meta-analysis results to confirm their beliefs. So this can be illustrated using the example of Julie's daughter um, shown in the cartoon on the right. So Julie's daughter knew that she had failed history when she decided to exclude minor subjects from her evidence synthesis and thus concluded that she was a straight A student. Um, another problem that we face with traditional meta-analyses um, is we're often trying to compare pears with apples. So studies may have been conducted in different populations, collected different outcomes at different time points, or use different measures. And this can make the combination of the studies in a meta-analysis difficult and sometimes even impossible. So for instance, in our recent study evaluating the landscape of COVID-19 trials in Australia, we found that the proportion of trials assessing key outcomes was low. So the first bar in the figure shows that only 18% um, assess shortness of breath. And in the last one, only 53% assessed mortality. And tw only 29% in, uh, included none of these outcomes. So that makes it impossible to synthesize results or make important comparisons for many of these trials. And Lena alluded to this earlier. Um, in our work on obesity prevention, we've also encountered a wide variety of measures being used to collect the same outcomes. So for example, physical activity can be assessed using the, an accelerometer um, or via questionnaire, for example. Um, and there are a number of different questionnaires and methods used to assess dietary intake. And again, this makes ev evidence synthesis extremely difficult and we're often not able to make use of all the available data and again, and resulting in more research waste. 